Okay, we're going to do a very light coverage of Laplace transforms. Uh, and uh, I usually give a, a lecture on the relationship between Laplace transforms and Fourier transforms. I think it is quite illuminating to see uh, that Laplace transforms are, um, are in some ways more powerful because uh, they converge for a broader class of problems, or a broader class of functions. Uh, but we're going to sort of skip through some of that stuff today uh, because we're almost out of time in this course. Uh, but this is our definition of the Fourier transform. Uh, we did this in the in the last lecture, and uh, and we saw that you know there were a lot of functions where where this doesn't work. Uh, for example, uh, if you try to Fourier transform a constant uh, or a function that is uh, that is you know ever increasing in polynomial style or uh, or even t to the minus one half. Uh, so all of these things give Fourier transforms problems. And if you encounter one of them, say as the driving term in your in your differential equation that you're working with, uh, of course that means that you can't solve that problem by Fourier transformation. So uh, for those problems uh, and for those reasons, Laplace transforms are pretty powerful and pretty popular. <coughs> so the uh, Laplace transform formula uh, is also an integral transform. Uh, it says that uh, if f of t is the function that's being transformed, then you get f hat of s. Uh, from an integral from 0 to infinity uh, with this kernel e to the minus s of t uh, dt. Uh, so the inversion formula uh, looks, looks rather bizarre if you've not seen it before. It's this contour integral formula uh, that starts from someplace on the real axis uh, beyond the point of any, any poles or singularities and, uh, and then goes uh, from minus infinity in the imaginary direction up to positive infinity. Okay, so uh, this is where all of these contour integrals come from, and they are um, they are rather difficult to do. Uh, of course, in our little ten week course, we aren't going to have time to spend too much uh, on on talking about those. Uh, but this part of the lecture that I'm skipping is usually a discussion of how this inversion formula emerges from the Fourier transform inversion formula when you add a convergence factor uh, to the Fourier transform. Uh, formula. So, so if I move over here, you can roughly see uh, what what's going on. Uh, you know, we we add, uh, we take a function that we couldn't transform, and we add a convergence factor e to the minus ct, uh, where the c is chosen big enough and real enough uh, so that this thing will will damp out any dependence uh, slower than an exponential, uh, and. And then we have to include this, uh, this truncation factor for everything off to the left because, of course, this function actually diverges on, on, uh, for negative t. And, and so this, this ends up giving rise to this uh, Bromwich integral uh, formula for inverting the Laplace transform. So we're going to skip all of that stuff today. Uh, and we're going to go on and talk about Laplace transforms in practice. Uh, in practice, we just need to know uh, the tabulated formulas and the properties that Laplace transforms have. Okay, so this is really, really, really a uh, uh, Laplace transforms light. I apologize. Uh, but these are the Fourier transform formulas and uh, a little short table of Fourier transform identities. Uh, the tables tend to be quite a bit longer for Laplace transform identities. So if you take a function f and it gets mapped to a function f hat, again we have relationships between uh, the the uh, Laplace transform of a function's derivative and the Laplace transform of the original function. Now instead of i omega, we get s uh, times f hat from the from the derivative of the original function. We get s times the the Laplace transform of the original function minus the uh, the function uh, at, at just an absolute moment after the initial time. So this is f. This is effectively the initial condition uh, f of zero. And if we do two derivatives, then we need not only the initial condition, but also the initial velocity, if you want to think of it as that. Uh, so this is now s squared f hat minus s times f uh, minus uh, f uh, prime of zero. Okay, so, um, so these are, you know, higher and higher derivatives follow, follow this pattern. And as you go uh, on down, of course, you can derive specific formulas for uh, specific functions. Uh, so let me try and just uh, highlight a few of those. Um, move this thing off out of the way. Uh, okay, so uh, so you know there is a um, there are a couple of really really important formulas here. Uh, there are formulas for the way 
uh, a shift in the dependent variable uh, results in a uh, exponential e to the a s uh, multiplied by the original Laplace transform, uh, and then you have um, you know shifts in the in the opposite direction uh, behave differently because this is crossing through zero, uh, and Laplace transforms are are funny when you cross through zero. Uh, okay, so if you have uh, e to the at uh, damping factor in front of your original function, it results in a shift in the Laplace transform variable domain, this s domain. Uh, there is also a convolution formula for Laplace transforms, and you guys, I'm sure, saw this when you were in college, uh, that the, uh, la this, this convolution integral is defined this way uh, as g of t minus tau, f of tau, uh, integrated over all tau between 0 and t, not like the Fourier convolution formula where these integration limits were minus infinity to infinity. Here it's a finite uh, interval over which you're convoluting things. And, and that gets transformed into the transform of f multiplied by the Laplace transform of g. Okay, so um, all the rest of them I think we can figure out as we go and reference back to this table. Uh, certainly before you launch into doing a big integral uh, for a Laplace transformation, uh, check to see uh, whether it's something that's on this table. And of course, uh, when it comes to Laplace transform inversion, uh, quite often you will not find things uh, that are on this table, but there are enormous tables for doing inverse Laplace transforms as well. Uh, so I recommend, uh, you know, getting a, a Bromowitz and Stegen or something like this, and uh, and using that rather than than plowing through uh, pages and pages of contour integrals. Uh, Mathematica also is quite good at doing Laplace transformations and inverse Laplace transformations, and I find it um, find it uh, very powerful in that regard. Okay, so let's do this sort of standard transport, uh, heat transfer, mass transfer kind of problem uh, where you've got a unsteady, uh, unsteady diffusion, let's say. Uh, so you've got a time derivative of u, uh, which represents in this case concentration, uh, set equal to two uh, spatial derivatives of u. Um, and, uh, and we've got a boundary condition now that is uh, that the uh, I'm sorry, an initial condition that says that the, the concentration is everywhere zero, and right at the uh, x equals zero line, uh, for all time greater than zero, we're going to require that the concentration be one, right? So, so this is the, in, intuitively, this is the nature of solutions that we expect. We expect them to sort of uh, rise very quickly at the beginning, and, uh, and then slower and slower, this concentration profile will penetrate into uh, the bulk of, of uh, this slab going off here in the x-direction towards infinity. So uh, this is an infinite half domain. You can't solve this problem with uh, eigenfunction expansion or any of these methods that we've already learned. Uh, and so we're going to have to do um, we're going to have to do some integral transform or else a similarity transformation. I realize you guys probably already learned those and already maybe know the answer to this problem uh, from your uh, from your transport class. Uh, so. Uh, so, so that's one way of doing it, and it's a very elegant way of doing it. But, uh, but we're going to start from the beginning and really derive that result uh, by using a Laplace transform. So you can Laplace transform the time variable, which is going uh, from from uh, zero to to infinity. Uh, you you could perhaps also think about transforming the x variable if you wanted, uh, but it but it really wouldn't work uh, wouldn't work the way it did in our in our Fourier transform case because this is now a boundary condition which would become the interior of your problem. Uh, so that, that turns out not to be a good strategy for solving this thing. Uh, and uh, a better strategy is to use Laplace transformation of the time variable. Uh, so doing that gives you the time derivative turns into s u hat minus the initial condition u naught. In this case that's very easy to incorporate because it's just zero. Uh, and, then, and then you have a Laplace transform of the time dependence in that spatial derivative term over there from the right hand side. Okay, so this is now our, our, our function. It looks, like a, uh, it looks like a standard ODE, second order, constant coefficient. That coefficient s is now just a parameter uh, that we will unravel to recapture the time dependence after we've solved this thing in the xs space. Uh, so now we just have an ODE. We also have to transform our, uh, our, our boundary condition in this case. Uh, and that gives us uh, 1 over s, right? So the, the Laplace transform of 1 
is 1 over s. And, uh, and so solving this equation, uh, we, have, um, we have basically an exponential uh, with, uh, with a square root of s uh, as our, as our uh, exponent coefficient up here. And, and so we have unknown coefficients that might depend on uh, s. Now we know that the uh, term here that's going out to, uh, to, as x goes out to infinity, this term better vanish, right? So, uh, so we're going to have to make c2 of s equal to 0. Uh, and, and now we have another boundary condition that says that if we let x equal 0, uh, this term obviously becomes 1, and that should become the Laplace transform of our boundary condition, therefore. Right? So we've got 1 over s has to be equal to 1 times c1 of s. Uh, so this is 1 over s then for c1. And that says that u hat is 1 over s times e to the minus sx. Okay? So what you really have here um, is, a, um, is a, a convolution, if you wanted to think of it. This is the convolution of 1. Uh, with this number. In that case, it, it's really trivially easy to, uh, to go back and do the convolution integral, of course. Uh, and you can just get this one from the tables directly if you have a, a bigger table than the one that I gave you. Undoubtedly, it will have this result uh, as one of the tabulated uh, inverses. Uh, and that gives you that u of xt, now we're back in the x time domain, uh, is uh, the error function complement uh, with an argument of x over square root of 4t. Uh, that's the usual similarity variable that you probably would have guessed uh, if you were doing this by similarity transformation. Okay, so this is a very, very simple uh, problem, uh, but, but you can actually use Laplace transforms to solve uh, much harder, much harder kinds of things, uh, things where a similarity transformation would, would certainly be difficult. Um, so uh, let's see uh, a little outline of a problem that you could do uh, and if you look on my website, you will see uh, that, that that has been done. Uh, let me just do the problem setup here uh, for now. And uh, so this is a case where you've got the same diffusion transport problem, uh, and you've got a boundary condition now that's a, of the Robin type. So it's a, a mixed uh, conduction uh, and a relation, basically a, a, a relationship between the heat transfer rate in this term uh, and the, uh, the value of the temperature uh, or the concentration in this term. Okay, so, so this now is, is this Robin kind of boundary condition and it's, and it's not so uh, trivial to deal with this thing uh, using, using standard methods. At least you would find that things would get extremely messy. Uh, and so, so we can Laplace transform this though and we can get a solution. Uh, so we're going to have an initial condition now that is uh, u0 uh, and uh, and our ordinary differential equation after Laplace transformation uh, so we get an ordinary differential equation by Laplace transforming this uh, again s u hat minus u naught now u naught is a constant it's not zero uh, so we're introducing one more parameter into our into our problem uh, and the boundary condition becomes becomes this, right? It's only derivatives in the x direction. So you just take the Laplace transform of the time dependence to get uh, to get this. And uh, the ODE that we get out is this. You have a lot of partial fraction decomposition to go through and do. This is the general form of the solution. Again, C1 and C2 uh, might might uh, not be constants here, um, and uh, they might depend on in, on s in pr in principle. And uh, this is the particular solution that's coming from the fact that we didn't, we didn't have zero as our initial condition. So notice that our initial condition became a uh, inhomogeneous uh, part of our, of our ODE and gave rise to this particular solution uh, with a parameter s, right? So that parameter s has all this time dependence wrapped up in it. Sorry, I'm pointing off my screen. These are the two homogeneous solutions, and that was the particular solution that arose because we have a uh, inhomogeneous term that came into the partial differential equation. Uh, well, it wasn't in the partial differential equation, but it's in the ODE that we get after the Laplace transformation because this initial condition brings it into the problem. Okay, so it makes sense that we lost time uh, and replaced it with this parameter s. Now something about the initial conditions of the problem must become part of the differential equation that we're solving. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, the solutions look like this. 
uh, this is u versus x at different times and, uh, and, and the solution, let me go ahead and give you the page where it actually writes the answer uh, to this problem. Uh, that solution uh, is this big complicated mess. You'd need a big table to go through and find this one. And uh, if you had one, you would find that it's u naught minus u naught times earth c. There's that similarity variable. Uh, there is the similarity variable appearing independently of t. So you can get an indication here that your normal similarity transformation is not going to work for this problem. And uh, just you know, one nice example of how powerful Laplace transforms are. Uh, and, and here again, your variables are appearing not in that usual similarity transformation form. Uh, so, so this is the uh, solution to this problem of, of heat, heat transfer from into an infinite, infinite slab. Uh, with a uh, with a Robin type boundary condition at the surface. Uh, okay, that's it.